Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Flesch, and I'm the director of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museums. And welcome to this fourth of seven presentations as part of the 2022 Winter Lyceum. Today is the 13th day of March 2022, and I'm broadcasting from Platteville, Wisconsin, home of the world's largest letter M on beautiful Platte Mound in the heart of the upper Mississippi Valley lead and zinc mining region where the Badger State was born. Reflecting on a wonderful year behind us, the museum campus celebrated three milestone anniversaries last year. Uh, we were founded in 1965 by the city of Platteville, and last year marked the 50th anniversary of the opening of the Mining Museum, the 45th anniversary of the opening of the Bevins Mine in the museum's backyard, and the 40th anniversary of the opening of the Rollo Jamison Museum. We've got many programs and initiatives in store for this special new year, including tonight's talk that celebrate 13,000 years of human ingenuity, inquiry, enterprise, and development, what might be called the pioneering spirit in the context of our unique driftless area landscape. I invite you all to stay up to date on these programs, as well as to make your reservations and to support current initiatives online at www.mining.jameson.museum. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to enjoy a preservation, a presentation by Dr. Jack Williams titled Driftless Area Ecosystems and Environments Since the Last Ice Age. I'd like to thank all of you who have registered to participate live today, as well as those who may be watching a recording of this event from our library of virtual programs. I extend a warm welcome to current friends of the Mining and Rollo Jameson Museum members and donors, and I'd like to thank the sponsors whose financial support has made this program possible. A&W Restaurant of Platteville, Claire Bank, Edward Jones Financial Advisor, Bob Hundhausen, FEH Design, H&R Block, Inspiring Community, uh, State Farm Agent Jordan Holthouse, and our media sponsor, Voice of the River Valley Magazine. And now, before we begin our program, I would like to invite you to participate in a question and answer session at the end of this evening's presentation. Because we're a big group, more than a 136, and we're doing this via Zoom, in the interest of time, I'd like to invite you to type out your questions as they come to mind and to submit them via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen during the talk. So may I please invite you to uh, take a moment and look for that Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So at the end, uh, our speaker will answer as many of the questions as he's able in the order in which they are received. So I'm now pleased to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, John Jack Williams is a professor in geography and a former director of the Center for Climatic Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He studies climate change and ecosystem responses to changing climates using the end of the last ice age as a model system for understanding the effects of large global rises in temperature. His work ranges from field work and coring lakes to helping lead and build global scale community databases. He and his wife, Sarah, have lived in Wisconsin since 2004 and have raised their kids here. They enjoy kayaking, dog walking, and board gaming. Dr. Williams is a fellow of the Ecological Society of America and Kellett Fellow at the UW-Madison. You can find more information on his faculty and lab pages of the UW-Madison Department of Geography website or connect with him on Twitter. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jack Williams. Eric, thank you. That's a very kind intro and really delighted to be here. And I'm going to start sharing screen and mess with tech for just a moment here. So getting screen shared and I'm also share sound. We remember we have to do that too. There'll be a video along the way. Um, yeah, so really great to be here. And of course, you know, sorry that I can't be there in person and really looking forward to seeing some of the things that Eric has described. Sounds like the, the museum's in a wonderful re revitalization period. And what I'd like to do today is give a talk that is going to look at this, you know, we are in a period of global environmental change right now. And I want to have us kind of wind back in time to look at previous periods of global environmental change and look at how species and ecosystems in general and in the driftless area in particular have been both transformed by past climatic change and have persisted and adapted to past climatic change. And, and as we'll see, 
the Driftless area is one of these incredible places of beauty and scenic wonder, and has also been a place that has sort of helped to steward biodiversity during past periods of environmental change. All right. Uh, okay, there we go. So just to kind of set the scene and set a little context, here's you know one of many you know beautiful you know photos could be chosen from of the Driftless area and its landscapes today. Here's you know, one version of what the Driftless area might have looked like uh, about 19,000 years ago. As we all know, of course, most of Wisconsin was covered by ice at the full glacial period with a big ice sheet dome sitting over Canada and, and all the way down to the eastern and northern uh, Wisconsin. But famously, the Driftless area, uh, where, where many of you are, was not covered by ice. And that's why we have these beautiful river valleys and things weren't bulldozed by the ice sheet, but right up against the margin, the terminus of the Laurentide ice sheet was in the area. So this is what the world might have looked like. And notably, you know, that, that former ice sheet and then the retreat of that ice sheet was caused by a global cooling of about six degrees Celsius or about 11 Fahrenheit. And then that melt of it was, was triggered by the warming of that. So one of the key points is that a five to six degree global warming can have massive effects upon melting ice and sea level and so forth. Also, then we step forward in time a little bit. This is what the world might have looked like, say 14,000 years ago. Humans arrived in the Americas, you know, the, the dates of earliest arrival have been getting pushed back. Uh, maybe now it's 15,000 years ago, perhaps as early as 22,000 uh, years ago, um, there's some evidence for. And at the same time, there's these large, strange beasts roaming the landscape, mastodons and camels and giant sloths and so forth. And this is what the, the, the first humans, uh, first Americans might have seen as they entered, uh, entered this new world. And so some of the things I want to kind of, the key points I want to kind of develop and build on as I go through the talk today, first is this idea of profound ecological change caused by large climate changes on the order of four to six degrees Celsius global warming. And as we zoom into the Driftless area, what we can see is that there were both large, you know, ecosystem scale, biome scale, ecosystem transformations, but also notable resilience as well. And then lots of species seem to have used the Driftless area as kind of a lifeboat or a refuge to ride out these past large climate change and preserve and survive up to the present day. This has led to this concept of uh, what are called climate resilient landscapes. What are the kinds of landscapes that seem to be particularly good at safeguarding biodiversity during periods of global environmental change? And the Driftless area has many of those key features. And then at the end, how can we help species adapt to the current changes around us today, drawing upon lessons from the past. So to kind of uh, sort of talk order, first set the stage at kind of global to continental scale, um, looking at some of the big things that happened from the last ice age to present, then talk for a few minutes about methods. How do we study the past and learn about past ecosystems and climate change? Then really zoom into the Driftless area and look at some of the big changes that we've seen in this uh, part of the world, um, you know, mostly focused on ecological systems and then move to the present and what we can draw, the lessons we can draw on for today. So um, again, you know, we go from a world at left, those two versions of earth to the world at right, where 20,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago, we have large ice sheets across Eurasia, across Canada, into the Northern US. Those ice sheets melt away and all that water goes into the world oceans over that 18,000 year period. So now we have a large ice sheet over Greenland, we have sea ice over the Arctic Ocean. We have seasonal snow and ice in various places. And of course, much of that is melting back now as temperatures rise at this point. So over this time period from roughly 20,000 years ago to present, we see a global temperature rise of four to six degrees Celsius. We see large meltback of ice sheets worldwide. Sea level rises by about 120 meters, about 400 feet worldwide. And driving much of this is a rise in carbon dioxide concentrations from about 190 parts per million in the atmosphere uh, during the glacial periods to about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere during the, the warmer interglacial periods. And now, of course, we're at you know, 415 and rising during the current Anthropocene. Here's just some data showing some of those different time series. The, I'll do a lot of these kind of plots where we have sort of 22,000 years ago to this case about 7,000 years ago. This is an age years before present and thousands of years. So we're going from older to the last glacial maximum, the last ice age is here. We're going forward in time to the right. And there's a couple things being, being plotted here. The yellow dots are carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere going from the glacial low, um, in which there's much less CO2 in the atmosphere back then, a steady rise with some stair steps and pauses along the way, and then more or less stability from about 11,000 years to about 7,000 years. And that's the yellow dots, that's the CO2. Those are coming from ice cores, little pockets of, of ancient air trapped in those ice cores. 
And then reconstructions of temperature for different parts of the world shown in red and blue. So we can see this very close correspondence between rising greenhouse gases and rising temperatures. And with that sea level rise, one of the things that's really underappreciated is just how different the world was 20,000 years ago. If you imagine a species or a human trying to navigate these landscapes, today's areas that are open and free to traverse were blocked by ice, such as between, say, um, Alaska and the lower 48, big ice sheets covering and blocking those. Other areas that are blocked by water, such as between eastern Siberia and Alaska, were all one big landmass, now drowned as sea level has risen. You can see how New Guinea and, uh, and Australia were all one landmass at, at the, during the last ice age. All of the Indonesia archipelago was part of Southeast Asia. So a completely different world in terms of biogeography and connectivity. And this is a time um, in which, as we come out of the last ice age, in which humans are dispersing worldwide out of their you know, uh, center of origin in Africa and over the last you know, 100,000 years, moving into different parts of the world, and believe that um, maybe as early as 22 to 23,000 years ago, humans come into the Americas, probably coming from the north. There used to be the idea that it came in through the ice free corridor, the strip of land that opened up between the Western Cordilleran ice sheet and the Eastern Laurentide ice sheet. But increasingly, it looks like people arrived in the Americas before that ice cream corridor opened up. And so now the favored migration route is a coastal route coming in along the Pacific Northwest into the lower 48 and rest of the Americas that way. And you can see here, these are some of the early sites. Clovis are you know, dated to about 13,000 years ago. And there's increasing evidence of pre-Clovis sites, uh, early human uh, sites here as up to 14 or 15,000 years ago. And you can see a couple of them are here in Eastern Wisconsin. So we have some of the earliest known human habitation sites in, uh, in the Americas. So I mostly work with ecological dynamics during this time period. So I'm kind of showing you some of the things that changed and drove a lot of these sort of ecological dynamics. So now what I want to do is show you an animation here. And to what I, we're going to see in a moment is after I press play is we're going to sort of, we're going to do an animation starting at about 20,000 years ago. You can see there's a little time marker up here, 21,000 years ago. You can see this big sea of blue, that's all ice. It's going to melt back as, as we move forward in time. And then the circles here are color coded by tree taxa or plant taxa. So oak and spruce and elm and ragweed and hemlock and so forth. And what we're gonna see is that as temperatures rise during this 20,000 year period, and as ice melts, we're gonna see these various plant taxa um, shift their ranges northward. And you can see them move into areas occupied by ice. You also see some taxa die out in the south as they start to become no longer favored by the climates. Is what we call like a leading edge of species moving north and a trailing edge of species dying out to the south or populations dying out to the south. Um, and this is all based on networks of fossil pollen records, which I'll talk more about in a moment, collected from lake sediments from around the US and around the, really around the world. So we're kind of stepping forward in time here. You can see lots of spruce starting to develop across the upper Midwest, these sort of spruce forests of parklands. You can see the ice free corridor opening up. You can see oak expanding northwards. There's a lot to watch here. I'll do this animation one more time. There's so much to see here. But one of the big takeaways to get from this is that when climates change, species move. That one way that species adapt to changing climates is by shifting their ranges northwards and or whatever is the way that most, you know, keeps them within their sort of preferred zone of climates. And it's quite complex. Some species move north following temperature. Maybe some species move east or west as moisture changes. At any given spot, you can see this transformation of species becoming abundant in the area, then as climates continue to change, becoming less abundant. So we kind of watch here in the Wisconsin area, we can see oak uh, spruce getting replaced by oak, for example. And we can see these ecosystem transformations that in which the primary driver are these changing climates with the end of the last ice age. And that's kind of sort of setting the, the big picture as we start to think about what we've seen here in the Driftless area. So with that kind of setup of the, of the story, that, now let's think about, well, how do we know? Where, where do those dots on the map come from? And what evidence do we have about past changes in ecosystems? And you know, we really are in this remarkable time because we have a whole bunch of different ways, some of which are kind of classic ways that paleontologists have been studying you know, past organisms, you know, you know, mammoths and mastodons and bones dug out of farmers' peat fields and everything else. So we've been doing that for centuries now. Then for about 100 years, we have been looking at what we call microfossils, pollen, which I'll be talking a lot about today, telling us about what kind of plants lived in an area, diatoms and foraminifera, these you know, uh, lake and marine organisms telling us about 
the aquatic communities and their sensitivity to different changes in temperature or salinity or what have you. You know, there's also a whole new revolution now in ancient DNA. And so the work that we're starting to be interested in is trying to pull ancient fragments of DNA out of lake sediments to see what kind of species live in that area. And then historical documents. As we move to the recent past and when we start to have oral histories or written records, we can, we can integrate these geological sources of information with these historical sources of information to look at past changing ecosystems and environments. So the work that I do and that I'll talk the most about is the work that uh, we do with lake sediments. And you know, there's, there's a reason why I'm in Wisconsin. There's many lakes here. There's many great places to go do our field work. My group works a bit in Wisconsin and really all over the upper Midwest. We have some active campaigns in Michigan and Indiana, and we've worked in Ohio, all kind of working in this sort of area of lakes formerly covered by the Laurentide Ice Sheet because all these little kettle holes left behind by the ice are these natural little collecting basins and traps for whatever kind of blows in or washes into the lake. And so in this example you see here, you see a whole bunch of you know, sort of, you know, cartoon trees near a lake. They are, you know, anybody who has our, our seasonal pollen allergies know that these trees and plants can disperse a lot of pollen in the spring and fall months when they're pollinating. And then some of that pollen winds up in, you know, settling out in the surface of the lake, falling down through the water column, and then being captured in the mud that's building up steadily at the bottom of the lakes. And all the lakes of Wisconsin are steadily filling in, maybe about by about a centimeter, a few inches every decade or so. So it's a very slow rate of fill in. But you know, give, give these lakes 15,000 years and they can start to build up tens of meters of mud at the bottom of them. And so we can go out and, and retrieve lake sediment cores and we can do a whole bunch of things from that. We can use radiocarbon dating to figure out how old the lakes are. The pollen tells us about what kind of plants lived around there. Charcoal tells us about how often and how big fires were. And then there's all these more specialized proxies that tells us things about water balance and temperature and maybe DNA fragments and all the rest of that. And you can see it left there, a couple of light microscope uh, uh, pictures of some different uh, pollen grains of chestnut and pine so that we on our microscope can visually identify these pollen and say, oh, we had lots of pine in this time period or that, you know, lots of chestnut at that time period and so forth. And you can see a picture here of, you know, a, a sediment core retrieved in the field and a crew on a floating platform on a lake uh, uh, working with a record. One more, because videos are always fun. Here's, a, here's just a quick video of about 40 seconds of us doing some field work, uh, uh, retrieving one of these cores. So we're, we're, we've got these coring rods that push down and now we're about to pull it up. And there's a meter long barrel that's holding the mud. And we, we push this all the way down into the sediment column and the local water. And we're doing our last, uh, that last drive. And we're getting ready to pull it out. We want to go quickly so we don't have any mud drop out the bottom of the tube. Once it breaks the water seal, it can start to drop out quickly. So she's catched, she's caught it. We've now brought it horizontal. And you can see that's about a meter, meter and a half length of mud that would probably represent a thousand to two thousand years of depositional time and a thousand to two thousand years of ecological history within that tube of mud. So we'll then take it back to the lab, sample it. You see the up arrows. We can remember which way it's up right. from when we collect it in the field. And there yeah. you go. That's our kind of that's an example of our field operations. So this kind of work has been going on for decades now. People have been coring lakes to look at past ecological history and climatic history. And there are lots of lakes in Wisconsin and Minnesota and elsewhere. So every triangle you see on the map there is a place where somebody has gone out and taken a lake sediment core, has worked up a pollen record and maybe some other evidence as well, radiocarbon dated it. And so we now have this increasingly dense network of sites all around the upper Midwest and Great Lakes region telling us about vegetation history and climate history in these different places. And that's what this kind of is what let me made those those animations you saw a few minutes ago of changes species distributions across space and time over the last 20 years. Now, if you look closely and kind of really kind of look at what's you might notice that in general, the driftless area is kind of an area of few sites. There's not that many triangles and this, you know, the driftless area being kind of this southwestern Wisconsin to, you know, southeastern, uh, you know, Minnesota, and northeastern Iowa. And well, of course, there's not that many lakes in the driftless area, right? Most of the lakes that we have in the upper Midwest were formed by retreating ice, leaving this sort of hummocky terrain and tilled pine that these little kettle holes filled in. The driftless area itself is mostly a fluvial riverine landscape. So there are little lakes here and there, but in general, they're, they're few and, 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 and hard to find. And so when you sort of see the history here, the sites that I'm gonna show to you dealt 
iconic one in Tamarack Creek being another example, you can see they're sort of at the edges of, of the driftless area. Much of what we know is from uh, the region. And so one of the holy grails is to find long records from the driftless area because um, in general, the definitional environment has not been favorable to them. So let's talk about what we do know from these kind of records that are, are available in the area. So again, just to kind of set the stage, here's kind of a closer look at the Thriftless area. And of course, many of you, I'm sure, know it well. And you can see, see this is a very riverine, dissected, ancient landscape. And where there's been a long time for these rivers to size in and erode away slowly over, over eons. And you can see these different iconic land, river valleys and bluffs and, 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 and marsh plains and so forth that form the incredible iconic Thriftless area landscape. Here is a, and so those folks today, and of course today, there's been heavy human modification, farming and logging and the legacies of past land use and mining, as Eric was talking about. One thing that we have is an amazing historical record is we have a shot of forest composition across Wisconsin, across really the, much of the U.S., from the early land surveyors, when they were marching across and starting to divide up the, the, the country into, into townships and ranges and all the rest of that. Every mile, they would stop and place a survey point. And at that survey point, they would mark the two to four closest trees to that survey point. And then the, the, their, they would repeat best guess at the identity of the species identity of those trees. And their guesses were pretty good, at least at the genus level and sometimes at the species level. So from those, those, those public land survey maps, we have a very good understanding of forest composition circa 1830, 1840, up to the 1860s, when Wisconsin was being surveyed and, and plotted. Um, and so we can see that this area had a lot of oak in it, fir oak, white oak, black oak, that's probably not too surprising. And there's a lot of efforts of people to kind of preserve these kind of oak savanna landscapes. There were these pockets of more mesic forests. You can see these are pockets where there's sugar maple and elm and basswood. So amidst this oak savanna, there's also these, these pockets, more mesic trees that would be more kind of closed canopy forest in the middle of this kind of oak savanna. And so here's a mapping of what you know, the, the previous maps were sort of tree species by tree species. Here's kind of a, a reconstruction of this kind of mosaic of the Driftless area that was mostly savanna, that kind of brick red color. There were patches of prairie, the kind of the tan color, but then also these patches of closed forest, often in sheltered behind rivers and other natural fire breaks. I'm not going to talk about this so much today, but the Driftless area is also a very fire prone landscape, you know, through climate or human agency. Fires were being set or occurring on a regular basis. And so places with a closed forest often has some kind of fire break protecting them, like a river junction or a steep set of hills, have you. So now to kind of now we kind of think about the landscape, let's now look at you know, this iconic you know, site. And I'm sure many of us have been to Devil's Lake many times, so it's a very familiar place to many of us. And you know, it's a beautiful lake, and it's a lake that um, groups like mine have gone out and poured. There was a first effort by Lou Marr, who was at UW Madison. He courted in the late 70s. And another team from Kansas came up and courted in the 2012. And so I'll show that rec more recent record um, from this site here. And so what we're looking at now, we've just, this is a pollen diagram. This is something that po pollen people use all the time to sort of display our data. And it's intuitive to po the pollenologists, and it's not intuitive to anybody else. So let's just spend a moment uh, orienting you to it. So we're now looking at time on the vertical axis because we're now kind of thinking like a lake and that we've had these sediments building up over time. The most recent sediments are at the top of the column and the oldest sediments are down buried at the bottom of the column. So we're going from oldest sediments at the bottom, 14,000 years ago, they were buried and deposited to the most recent sediments up at the top. So by going up, we're kind of going up in time as you go up in the sediment column. And then we're looking here at the percent abundance, and the, the, I don't have the, the, um, the scale bars on here, but this is basically per percent abundance of different tree taxa. And so for every point here, for every time you see a, you know, a data point, somebody at that say, at that, that horizon has counted a 300 pollen grains from a cubic centimeter of mud, and they have counted the number of spruce or pine or oak or what have you, and then these are being expressed in percentage terms. So from this assemblage at say this point right here about 13,000 years ago, somewhere on the order of maybe 30 to 40% of all the pollen grains found are spruce pollen. And that's by inference, telling us there's lots of spruce trees on the landscape here. So the, 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 the typical model we have is that lots of pollen implies lots of trees producing that pollen of that type. 
And so we then, and then the, the, these green curves are all different tree tax I'm focusing on here. And then this black curve at right is our counts of the amount of, number of charcoal flecks that are in, in that. And so that becomes some index of fires. Anytime you see a big peak, that's probably a big fire that burns somewhere in the, in the Devil's Lake watershed. And then kind of that background curve tells you something about the amount, the amount of biomass being burned from a kind of high biomass producing lots of charcoal to less so. So the kind of step forward, you know, right after, you know, ice that was around Devil's Lake pulled back, Devil's Lake was right at the end of the edge of the ice sheet. First landscape that likely formed was this kind of spruce parkland, lots of spruce trees, poplars, aspens, a fair amount of fire actually, and then probably big animals, you know, grazing and browsing these landscapes. So sometimes people call this a Pleistocene parkland or mixed parkland. That was the first kind of ecosystem. And again, also think climatically that the world at this point is maybe about, well, let's say three degrees colder than present, give or take. So it's a cold world and we have these mostly kind of boreal taxa. These would be like white spruces and black spruces, trees today that are mostly found in Northern Wisconsin and all the way up through Canada. Today, we're living you know, quite happily in this area 15, 14,000 years ago. Well, the world keeps warming and Wisconsin keeps warming, and it, maybe there's also some gets a bit drier. There's some evidence for a drier period this time too. And those spruce trees largely die out. You know that you know they are not really found so much in the with maybe a few little pockets here or there in the Devil's Lake area anymore. Pine becomes very abundant, so we get this pine period between about 11,000 and 10,000 years ago. It's relatively brief. I mean, it's still a thousand years, but it's it's relatively brief on this time scale in which we have mostly pine forest dominating the landscape. You can see a fair amount of birch in the area as well. So you think about like kind of a pine birch forest like you might find in Northern Wisconsin. And then those taxa give way. And again, keep, keep this model of you know, rising temperatures, changing climates, driving these ecosystem transformations. Those give way to oaks and elms becoming the dominant tree taxa on the landscape. And you can see there's a period there for about 5,000 years or so where there's lots of oak pollen and, and oak trees in the landscape, but also a lot of elm pollen as well. So maybe a little bit wetter than more of these kind of mesic forests being common. And then and we get up to about 6,000 years ago and those elms start to become less abundant. And it becomes much more of kind of an open oak savanna kind of landscape. And so we sort of see this sort of series of, you know, at least four major ecosystem transformations in this one spot um, uh, in this area. And you know, even though we have this kind of one lake here, looking at other records around the upper Midwest, this is a very characteristic set of transformations. So this probably happened across the Driftless area and probably across much of Southern Wisconsin and Southern uh, Minnesota and, and across much of the Midwest in general. So that was one site from Devil's Lake. And um, another site that, this is a Tamarack Creek up in the Northern part of the Driftless area. You can see that this record actually only goes for the Devil's Lake one. And so we don't get the full sweep of glacial and post-glacial history like we did, but it's again, any record is a good one when we're working the Driftless area, because you just don't have that many lakes and sites to work with here. At this site, there's a fair amount of pine and there's a fair amount of oak and there's a lot of sedge. And so the interpretation given all the sedge pollen, and this is probably a wetland, some kind of like, you know, marshy, swamp land with lots of sedge plants growing in. So probably a lot of that sedge is very local that's just being deposited into this site here. And then you can see that um, around a thousand years ago, we start to get a lot of large, so it probably gets more of a kind of a large bog. So, you know, this would be interpreted more of kind of like wetland succession, going from like a sedge to a large wetland. And then you might notice there's this big spike hagweed a few hundred years ago. It's a little hard to see the time scale. This is maybe 200 years ago. And this is basically Euro-American arrival and land so when people start to settle the area, mining ragweed explodes. It's, it's, it was native. We had ragweed you know, before uh, Euro-Americans arrived, but it really likes disturbed environments, you know, lots of land use and land clearance going on. And so it explodes in abundance. That becomes one of our big indicators of sort of the Euro-American horizon and, and land use and land settlement. So what I've just done now is is walk through a, um, a series of these kind of transformations. And one of the points to make is that, you know, the Driftless area we know today is very different from the Driftless area of a few hundred years ago before all of our, our, our Euro-American land use. And it's very different from the, from the Driftless area of 15,000 
uh, right after the ice retreated and right after, you know, as these temperatures were, were rising worldwide. But the other point to make about this is that the Driftless area is also famous, of course, for being this incredible um, locus of biodiversity. Um, this is a map, just kind of talking about the map here first. This is a map put together by NatureServe, which is a, you know, a, a nature conservation and, and uh, conservation science group. And they have made maps of all the species in the US that are um, either protected under the, under the Endangered Species Act or believed to be at risk of extinction. And then this is a count of the number of species fitting those categories per location. And unfortunately, I don't have a legend for this, uh, but you can sort of see that the blue would be less, the reds would be more. And you can sort of see that this area, the driftless area, is an area where lots of endangered species live. It is a place that has been hospitable to them. And we find lots of species that are found here and sometimes nowhere else. So we have another Northern Monkshood, for example, as a plant that's protected under the Endangered Species Act. We have the Iowa Pleistocene snail that was believed to be on the Iowa side of the driftless area. So these, you know, these small endemic species found here and often nowhere else. This is the same kind of map, same group, but now what they've done is they've taken those um, uh, rare species and they've, they've further scaled them by the, the range size. So they, are, they, are they widespread or very small ranges? And so this is now basically showing these small ranged and endangered species. And once again, the uh, driftless area really stands out for having these species that are really found here and not many other places, or maybe just here. And so um, it really highlights the importance of the driftless area as a sort of biodiversity refuge. And, and one point to make too is that these species that are found here and only here have probably lived here back to the last ice age and maybe back through prior ice ages. So this is really suggests that the driftless area is what we sometimes call a climate refuge where the species that lived here just persisted here, despite all those ecosystem transformations I just showed you of you know, spruce giving way to pine forests and oak savannas and all the rest of that. These little species in these little endemic pockets have been hanging out here and writing out all these climate changes and all these um, uh, environmental ecological changes. So if you so say, what do we kind of see what we learn from the driftless area we can really see both things happening. We can see these ecosystem transformations. And this is the kind of evidence from Devil's sites like Devil's Lake that have land managers around the country and around the world today really thinking about what does a two degree warming look like or a four degree warming look like as we start to think about our futures over the coming decades and really starting to expect that ecosystem transformations are gonna be one of the outcomes, particularly under the higher end warming climate change scenarios because of what we've seen in the past, a six degree global warming Celsius with the end of last ice age produced these sort of series of ecosystem transformations that you see in that Devil's Lake record. At the same time, some species, they have ability to persist. They ride out climate change. They find their little refuges, their little pockets of hillsides or soil patches where it's uniquely favorable to them. And they seem to ride out these changes in, you know, from past to present, giving us hope that as climate changes around us today, that they can also persist if we protect those habitats and protect those species. So with that, let's kind of then sort of, kind of, you know, sort of segue to give what we know, what does this imply for what do we do today? And one of the frameworks that's emerging among ecosystem managers, this has been most particularly led by scientists at the National Park Service, but it's kind of a federal agency-wide framework that's emerging is that we think about changing climates past and present and future, how do we manage and steer that? One framework that's coming up is called RAD, Resist, Accept, Direct. And the metaphor here, you can sort of see, you know, there's sort of a metaphor of, of a boat or sailors, and there's a strong wind pushing everything in one direction. The resist option would be like, well, let's work again, let's push against the wind. Let's, you know, let's gun the motor and go into the waves and go against the wind and, and maintain our position or maybe slow down how fast we're pushed. So we might want to preserve a particular, particularly cherished ecosystem or culturally rel relevant landscape and try to protect that and try to minimize the effects of climate change on that landscape. Maybe we start to plant shade over, you know, favored trout habitat in the driftless areas, a way of protecting those trout populations from the higher temperatures expected for region. That would be a resist strategy. Or we accept, we accept, we, we go with the wind, we go with the flow, we don't invest our effort, we let things play out knowing that climate has changed in the past and species have, have tolerated that and we uh, accept those transformations and we see what emerges. 
That will happen in many places just because we can't be everywhere. And then direct. Maybe there's some places where we want to direct the outcome. We can sort of see in this example, the, the sailor sort of heading for a you know, safe harbor, this example here. And you know, in places like Acadia National Park, they're starting to try to plant certain species so that they have you know, the forests of the future as opposed to the shrublands or you know, kind of depauperate systems that they are afraid might happen if they don't take action and adapt to climate change. And if we think about the ways that species have adapted or handled past climate change and ways they might or would handle climate change today, we can see all these different things happening. We can see some species just persisting in place, having these little refugia where they hang out, so being a good example of that. We can see these continental scale range shifts of species moving at large distances, tracking changing climates as climates change. Um, Sometimes what we see is you know, adaptation. There's you know, these, these wood rats, these uh, in say the Western US show evidence of going from being larger body sizes during the cold glacial periods to small body sizes during the warmer interglacial periods. So this, you know, there are other ways for species to handle changing climate. And then of course, some species didn't make it. And you know, in the past, the best evidence is that this is probably some synergy of changing climates, changing human pressures, you know, other stressors, changing habitats on these populations. And so that's also a cautionary note for us that some species did go extinct during past environmental change, probably due to a variety of factors. So if we think about what makes, what, you know, when we sort of ask the question, what makes any given landscape a climate refuge or a climate resilient landscape? There's different, you know, there's kind of, you know, people have talked about this and looked pretty closely at the past. There's some general factors that people have come up with. Well, one is the idea of low climate variability. Maybe global temperatures are going up and down by six degrees, some last ice days today, but maybe locally temperature changes in the driftless area weren't as big. Well, that might be a, a, a mechanism in other places that might explain, you know, hot spots of biodiversity in, in other parts of the world, like the tropics, for example, but that doesn't seem to be what explains what happened in the driftless area. Here's a mapping of a metric called climate change velocity. I'm not going to get into how climate change velocity is calculated, but it's basically a measure of magnitude and rate of change. And this is from the last ice age to present. So that, that kind of dashed or that, that solid black line you see there is the former ice sheet extent on this kind of coarse grid scale. And then all the red areas are areas that had high climate velocity from the last glacial maximum, last ice age to present. Blue would be low velocity. And we can see that here in the upper Midwest, we generally had pretty high velocities. And so this seems to be a place where, um, you know, although climate change was large and rapid in many times, still species persisted. Well, if that doesn't explain why the driftless area had lots of species persist through the last ice age or why it's a climate resilient landscape, well, what about topographic complexity? And this is another favorite hypothesis because you know, the idea is that you have, if you have changing climates, you know, temperatures rising worldwide, well, locally, you might have all these little microclimates, one side of the hillside versus the other side of the hillside, you know, if you're a little amphibian, be able to get into a little cave or a little burrow. And of course, as we know, the, 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 the driftless area is highly complex, lots of bluffs and hills and valleys and marshes. So this seems to be a very good reason for why we have this being a climate resilient landscape. And then also a third factor is connectivity. Can species move among habitats? So if climates change and one habitat patch becomes less favorable, another habitat patch becomes more favorable, can species move from place to place? And you can see how incredibly connected, and you know, even though it's a very complex landscape, there's all these corridors, there's all these river valleys, there's all these ways that species could potentially move from spot to spot in the past and in the present. So this is why this idea of habitat connectivity is so important in the past and is so important today as well. So for this reason, you know, as different conservation groups look to how do, you know, given that we're now in a world in which climates are changing and we can hope to slow down the rate of change, but we necessarily, but we have climate change happening already and more in the pipeline, you know, so how do we deal with that as, as, as scientists and maybe as conservationists? And so has, there's been this effort to identify these climate resilient landscapes. And again, highlighting how the driftless area has been one of these focal areas. So there's been this nature conservancy group effort to identify and, and map these climate resilient areas and the driftless drift area very much being one of those. And then this is a nice piece that came out in the Wisconsin State Journal about a year and a half ago, uh, flagging how the driftless area and it's, you know, by fortune, the, the landscapes we find most beautiful, these rugged terrains are also typically great landscapes for preserving species as well. 
So if we then think about, you know, where, as you sort of think about this and how to, you know, think about what we've learned from the past and lessons for today, the things that we could do today around climate change and adaptation is certainly trying to slow down or halt climate change. You know, if we can stabilize the climate system and keep greenhouse gases from going up, then that would be good in terms of slowing down the rate of climate change and giving more species more time to adapt. We can look for ways to accelerate rates of ecological and evolutionary adaptation. You know, there may be cases when we start to maybe you know, help transplant populations in the areas that are newly favorable for them. That would be an example of things we could do. And then protecting these particularly critical climate resilient landscapes like the Drifus area as these sort of jewels and icons of these past and present biodiversity. So I'll just start to wrap up here. I know I've been talking for a little bit, just checking my watch. So I think we're at a good time to start to move to questions here, but just to kind of wrap up and hit some of those key messages again. Again, this point that we see that the last ice age to present was this period of, of major transformative climate change. It's one of our best model systems to look at what happens to ecosystems when the world warms by four to six degrees Celsius. We can see that in dripless area, we have evidence of both transformation and resilience ecosystem scale transformations, three or four of them over this time period, but then also lots of little species kind of hanging out and persisting through it all. And that therefore, this shows us of the kinds of refugia, the kinds of climate resilient landscapes that are most critical to preserve today as we head into the changing world around us. And that there's lots of things we can do to help species adapt, including protecting these beautiful landscapes like the Drifts area. So I will stop there and I'll just give some thanks to, a, you know, a lot of people in my research group have worked on these kind of records and data over the years. We have a number of people that I've, I've been showing data for the Neotoma Paleoecology Database, which is I've been showing you records from the upper Midwest and the continent, but it's a global effort. And there's lots of people working all around the world to both collect these records and then gather together these records, all with the goal of helping inform our efforts to conserve biodiversity today by understanding how species and ecosystems respond to, to past climate change at local to global scales. So this has been funded by the US National Science Foundation, by the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and many others. So thank you all for your time and attention. I'd be really happy to take questions at this point. Thank you. Okay, great job, Jack. I Wow, I, I, I know how much uh, field work and uh, lab time and uh, processing time it took for you to develop all of these uh, fascinating conclusions. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, if you don't mind if I ask a question first before I get to some from the audience says, uh, so are you saying that the driftless area has indeed been resilient and that it is a kind of a natural museum, if you will, of uh, flora and fauna from, from many time periods of the past. Yeah, to confirm, that's right. That it is like, a, people call it like a climate refuge or refugia, that the Driftless area very much has been a refuge for these species, like, you know, the monk's hood and the, that snail probably have been this area going back through the last ice age in prior climate changes and glacial and glacial cycles. So yes, it is acting as this kind of museum and refuge for these key species. Um, Michelle asks if you would be kind enough to display one of your earlier slides again, in which you were uh, looking at carbon dioxide uh, parts per million, and yep. and I think you were comparing uh, gases today to that of uh, ice age time. Yes. Okay, you can see it now. Yes. So and so the question is um, comparing where we are today to the time period that's on the graph. Um, how, what's the relationship? Yeah, you know, there's a slide that I pulled that I, gives a bigger context. So I'm just gonna, maybe I'll do a quick little side step to show that, give me a sec to find it. Because I do, I, I wasn't, as always, how much stuff to give in one talk is always a question. Um, here we go. This, this is a common talk I give when I'm kind of setting the stage, but this is, a, this is a, a fuller view of climate history that puts past and present in context. So the whole talk I just gave is from here, 20,000 years ago, last ice age to present. And now we can see the 20th century going off in the 21st century in some of these scenarios here. And now just to kind of talk through this for a moment, we can actually zoom back. We're actually going back on this left side, back to 60 million years ago. And so what, what we're looking at here is changes in temperature relative to today. 
And we can see that over the last 60 million years, there's been this long-term cooling of the climate system. This is from the end of the age of the dinosaurs. You know, the whole world is cooling. We have these ice ages, these glacial and glacial cycles. This is the last ice age. We have ice sitting over Wisconsin and all the stuff I've talked about was over this time period. And then here we are heading off into the future. And so one of the messages here is that we have seen lots of climate change in the past and that the climates we are heading to may have some precedent you know, millions of years ago. And so species have survived past climate change at the same time, these are transformative. When, that, when these kind of big climate changes happen, we see big changes in species distributions. And also the rate of climate change today is much faster than the rates of most climate changes over the geological record. So it's that rate of change of a particular concern to many biologists today. Uh, Bill robichaud has got a similar question uh, to one that I have, which is, uh, could you please review what some of the controls are um, in uh, in historic times or on the on the climate, and yeah. uh, and if it included carbon dioxide, why would carbon dioxide have been changing? And then what are some other controls, like you know, uh, how important are things like sunspots or sulfuric acid in the atmosphere or other things like that? Yeah, great. So I'll do a quick plug here. I teach a fall semester class on paleoclimatology that goes through past climate variations and the drivers of that. And we do offer, um, uh, for anybody who's retired in the audience, we'd like to learn about this topic. We have these senior auditors who take that class all the time. It's a very popular one for senior auditors. So if you want the, the semester unpack, 335 geography is what I would recommend. But in two minutes, I'll do the short version. So there are different controls at different time scales. This long-term Cenozoic cooling that we see over this time scale, that is mostly driven by plate tectonics, which regulate the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When there's lots of volcanic outgassing at these long time scales, that can put more CO2 in the atmosphere. And when there's actually lots of rock weathering as mountains corrode and erode, and erode away, that erosion process actually draws CO2 out of the atmosphere. There's some chemical reactions that consume CO2 during the process. So this long-term cooling is, in, is most likely driven by India colliding into Asia, forming the Himalayas and increasing rates of rock weathering that are drawing CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's the big driver of the cooling. Then we have these very regular you know, ice ages, cycle, 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 cycle. These are driven by changes in the Earth's orbit. The, the circularity or eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, the tilts of the Earth, the wobble like a top of the axis of the Earth, there's a, there's a very regular period of those of, of a 20,000 year to 100,000 year beat or periodicity. And it's that change in the Earth's orbit that drives these ice ages, cycle, 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 and this very regular period to that. That's what's happening at those time scales. Then when we get up and then well, that's, you know, and then, um, and then um, in terms of why, you know, and then thinking about, you know, why do changes in Earth's orbit affect all this, what they end up doing is affecting the amount of sunlight in the high latitudes that then melts ice back. And then as ice starts to melt, that starts to change ocean circulation. And the ocean is a huge reservoir of carbon dioxide. And during glacial periods, that carbon dioxide is trapped in the deep ocean. And then during the warm interglacial periods, that carbon dioxide is gassed out of the ocean into the atmosphere. So the reason why you had that, why are CO2 and temperature following each other so closely on these time scales? It's because there's a sort of gassing release of carbon dioxide into and out of the oceans into the atmosphere. So there's, a, there's, a, there's actually some fairly complex ice, ocean, carbon cycle feedbacks that are governing that, but that's what's happening. And then when it comes to things like sunspot cycles and individual eruptions like Krakatoa or Mount Pinatubo, those are what we start to see all the little, little wiggles and bumps over the last you know, year by year, decade by decade, because volcanic eruptions like Krakatoa can cool the world very briefly for a few years at a time with all the dust they put in the atmosphere to kind of cool the air. And likewise, sunspots have a very brief effect. And so um, we, sort of, we start to get this sort of interannual variability here. That's when you sort of see like these individual eruptions and sunspot type effects. So different drivers at different time scales is one of the short takeaways. It's interesting to think about carbon dioxide and the carbon cycle and, and huge quantities of carbon dioxide um, sunk into sediments at the bottom of oceans. And then later those sediments are lithified into limestones and dolostones of the kind that we see in the layered rocks, yeah. and the road cuts of the driftless area. Is that uh, 
possible to get any kind of useful climate data out of uh, lithified carbonate sediments? Yeah, yeah, in fact, so like limestones and particularly the little marine organisms, like I mentioned foraminifera a little while ago, those are little marine carbonate organisms that you could find in, in, in lithified rocks. And then there's deep sea drilling campaigns to go get those out of, out of marine sediments. Um, those are some of our best indicators of past climates. So yes, there's a whole lot of work that people do with carbonate sediments and marine carbonate sediments as indicators of past climates. And this whole, this, this whole long record here of global cooling those are basically those are mostly based upon ocean sediment records, mostly carbonate ocean sediment records that are the basis of these paleoclimatic indicators, little forams and isotopes that tell us about past temperatures and um, that far back in time. Are, are the fossils in our driftless area too uh, like solidified to get that kind of data from, or can you get it from fossils in the driftless? You can get it from fossils, and there are people who, who use, like, you know, like you imagine how individual snails or organisms have a, have a preferred temperature range. So people do use those right. dripless area fossils to come up with estimates of past temperature. So yes, those can be used as well. But the right. difference between the terrestrial record and the marine record is that the terrestrial record is patchy, right? We have an outcrop here and an outcrop there, whereas the marine sediments have been building up continuously for the last 50 million years. So our big continuous time series tend to come out of these marine sediment contexts. But these terrestrial records are very valuable. And so, yes, there is value in the fossils that people collect in terms of past indicators of past climate and life responses to past climate. Great. Uh, Joan asked a question about uh, the relic pine populations of the driftless. Um, and she asked, do they date back to 11,000 years ago? Do they yes. Okay. Yeah, so there are these little pockets, like, like Parfreeze Glen is a, is a famous little pocket of tree population, this is a good example of these micro refugia, right? These cool little river valleys where those pine populations, of course, you know, the individuals, there's been multiple generations of trees that have come and gone over the last 10,000 years, but that population probably is a refugial population that's a little pocket that's found a little cold microclimate, basically waiting for the next ice age, right? You know, if we weren't here, you know, burning greenhouse, you know, putting greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, we would expect to be heading back into another ice age sometime over the next five to 20,000 years. And so that little pocket of, of pines hanging on in Parkfreeze Glen might be then to sort of recolonize across the driftless area as we headed back into the cold climates of some, you know, some hypothetical future. Bill's interested a little bit more about the history of Devil's Lake and um, roughly how old is it? And um, based on the fact that charcoal was deposited some 6,000 years ago, does that mean it was a lake at least uh, that long ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, let me go back to uh, do, 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 Devil's Lake, just have it up so people can look at it. Yeah, let's go to one of these, there we go. Yeah, so you can see that this time series, uh, it's the oldest you're seeing here is 14,000 years ago. The oldest radiocarbon date that the team has, that published this paper uh, was able to get was 17,000 years. And so um, the, and these, the, uh, the lake may be even older than that in the sense of, you know, there was, there was, the ice was right up against the lake and it was probably uh, uh, been a lake for a long time. But, you know, say, let's say 50,000 years ago or however old it might've been, it was probably a very inorganic lake with just silts, you know, coming out of this ice there. So in terms of any kind of organic carbon that we can actually radiocarbon date and then come up with some age estimate, the oldest we've been able to go is a 17,000 years. We know the lake is at least 17,000 years old. And then even those early sediments are very organic poor, which is why there's no pollen being shown here. There's almost nothing organic in those early sediments. So in terms of like some sense of a vegetated landscape around this, this site, that begins about 14,000 years ago or so. And then, yeah, you can see that there have been fires on this landscape, looking at that charcoal record. And you know, I didn't really talk about fire history, but you can see there's some really interesting stories here, right? There's periods of high fire activity and periods of low fire activity. You can see this sort of peak, you know, a few hundred years ago, um, relating probably, you know, some mixture maybe of Native American land use and or Euro-American uh, land use. Um, and so, yeah, there's a whole story to think about, about the fire history and fire ecology of the Devil's Lake region. Well, and what was that big change from around 5,500 years ago uh, um, and older? Yeah, you know, you know, there's so many talks to give or something. So over the last 10,000 years, this interglacial period, 
it, the temperatures have been relatively uniform across the Midwest and worldwide. There may be a little bit of variation here and there, but nothing like we saw coming out of the last ice age. But the big change in this region has been changes in, in moisture availability. There's been periods of wet and dry. And it's, it's well known that, and it depends a little bit on where you were in the Great Plains, but that there were wetter periods and, and drier periods. So the most common interpretation would be that this was a relatively wet period in this area from about 10,000 to about 6,000 years ago. And then things got locally drier and then that led to the establishment and expansion of these oak savannas. And so it's these kind of regional changes in water availability, um, and, you know, shifting storm tracks and you know, changing, you know, the, remember sort of these orbital changes, changing how much sunlight different areas receive, maybe changing the position of the jet stream and so forth. So that's believed to be what's driving some of these you know, ecosystem changes during the, during the interglacial. And, are, and would the source of the charcoal have been natural fires um, greater than 5,500 years ago or man-made fires or, may, or maybe both or do we, is there a way to tell? The, the short version is not, you know, based upon these lake center records, there's not a way to tell, right? You know, if you think about what a fire is, there's some ignition event by a lightning strike or a human or what have you. And then that, that, that spreads across some area, a whole lot of trees and plants get burned and then some charcoal from that winds up in the lake sediment. So what we have is the outcome of these charcoal particles winding up in our lakes, but we don't really have any information about what the ignition event was. And so if we want to kind of get at the question about, well, what caused these fires and, you know, was it, you know, changes in say, you know, if you think about what it could have been, it could have been, you know, changes in say lightning frequency, it could have been changes in, you know, drying, you know, drying things out, making things more susceptible to burning when a fire happened. It could be changes in fuel load, you know, more biomass for burning could produce more charcoal or more kind of readiness of fire to spread. And then of course it could be humans, right? You know, humans in the landscape burning these landscapes. And it's, it's some combination of all of them. And I would say one of the, the grand challenges are for our field is to really try to integrate these different lines of evidence. You know, talk to the paleoclimatologists to figure out what changing climates were like over this time period. Talk to the paleoecologists like myself about changing ecosystems, changing vegetation. And then talk to the archeologists and Native Americans and indigenous communities about changing human, you know, you know, human communities and how they are using these landscapes and these resources. And that, that grand synthesis is still a piece at a time. It takes a lot of work talking to different folks from different communities and gathering these different kinds of data together. And so that is an area I think we still do not have a very good answer on about how much of these changes were climate driven versus human driven over this say last 10,000 years. Um, so your answers are fabulous and I, I'm, if you don't mind, I'll ask one more uh, question about charcoal, and that is uh, there was an uh, attendee who had uh, a similar question as as me, in which uh, you were speaking of the rise of the oaks in the oak savanna time period, and there is kind of a surprise because it's somewhere in that like charcoal rich uh, period of um, uh, greater than ten thousand years ago but uh, less than um, 5,000 years ago, yeah, from like five to 10,000 years ago, where it's, it's the rise of the oaks, but it's all, there's also a lot of charcoal. And so you're talking about how uh, the drier time period allowed the oaks to take over, and yet, excuse me, the wetter, right? You said it was wetter, <laughs> therefore the oaks took over, but there's also a whole lot of charcoal. Uh, how yeah. do you make, the, make of that? What do you make of that? Right. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It gets complex fast, right? And it's to some degree, you know, like you, we always kind of stare at this and puzzle at this and come up with our best hypotheses. Um, but again, one thing to remember here is the role of fuel load. And, you know, one thing we don't, a couple of comments. One thing is we don't, unfortunately with pollen, we don't know the species of oak, right? So you think about different kinds of oak, there could be more of the mesic oaks, like some of the white oaks, I mean, some more of the, the, the you know, like the chinkapins are more kind of prairie oaks, right? So there's different oak species that have, that specialize in more, wet or dry environments. And unfortunately with the pollen, we don't know. You go back to those survey data that I showed you early on, and then you can have some information about what kind of oaks wear. But for the pollen data, all we know is that it's oak, and that's an unfortunate limitation. So if I were to kind of make my best guess at what's going on here, is that we have a relatively wet climate with oaks and elms. And elm, you know, you can think of as kind of a more music species. Like elm is pretty clearly more of a bottomland or maybe kind of somewhat dry, but it's not gonna be in a, in a, in a savanna prairie typically. But there's also lots of biomass, right? There's lots of trees around to produce lots of charcoal. Mm -hmm. And so when, there's, when a fire does happen, it burns a lot of wood, and a lot of charcoal winds up in the lake. 
And then you get to more of this kind of open oak landscape. And you can see there's still fires happening here, but they tend to maybe, maybe any, any single fire doesn't produce that much charcoal. So the lake is actually not seeing that much. So you can might imagine kind of maybe very regular, but very low intensity fires that don't produce a lot of charcoal, but every now and then they really do have a big one that burns a lot of oak trees down, a lot of charcoal winds up in the lake. So it's, it's the kind of fire and the kind of vegetation that's getting burned that might be affecting this, this signal and the charcoal record that we're seeing here. Yeah, I think you nailed it. That really helped clear it up, I think, uh, for me. That uh, holds water. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tom uh, Hunt asks if you could speak a little bit uh, more about uh, resilience, um, specifically the relative importance of drainage density and aspect variability um, that drive topographic effects on resilience. That is a great question. And I would say it depends a lot upon the organism you're thinking about, right? I think a lot about plants. And so clearly for plants, like slope and aspect matters, matters tremendously. How much sunlight, you know, you might even imagine like, you know, how much, you know, is it, is it a narrow valley or a broad valley, right? How much sunlight are they going to receive over the course of the day? And how much will they warm up over the course of the day? Like a little, little narrow pocket, like Parkby's group Glen, staying cool for that, for that um, particular species, right? Versus a, maybe a more exposed southern facing slope. Um, so slope and aspect matters a lot for plants because of the temperature and water controls. But if you, start, if you then start to think about like salamanders or snails, you know, something like that, 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 that those aquatic habitats and those little river corridors, you know, I didn't, another slide I didn't show is like looking at the genetic diversity of, of fish populations. I've been focusing mostly on the terrestrial communities, but the driftless area is also a locus of biodiversity for, you know, aquatic communities as well, because of all these little mini streams and side streams and, and you, know, you know, sunny and shaded portions and all the rest of that. So it's, I think at some level, it's an all of the above type answer. All these different components of topographic and landscape complexity helps encourage a different form of biodiversity of all these different organisms inhabit, you know, inhabiting these landscapes. Okay, now we're getting to a new, uh, a new interesting place. Um, Bill kind of follows up with you're talking about aquatic communities that we think of the brook trout as the classic native trout of Wisconsin and the driftless. However, in recent conversations he's had with a Wisconsin archaeologist, um, they noted that no brook trout bones have been found at Native American archaeological sites in Wisconsin, although other fish bones have been identified. And so does that mean that brook trout have perhaps been in the area uh, uh, fairly recently? That's a great question. That's where I was trying to defer to my zoo archaeological colleagues who would know that kind of data better than I, but I would certainly expect that if brook trout or brown trout were in this area, that Native American populations would have been, would have been catching them, right? They'd be a great food resource, and so I would be, um, and I would also trust my zoar colleagues that if they were being caught and consumed, that they would have found them. Like those would be, there'd be lots of bones produced in, in middens or other archaeological sites, and so that, to me, would be a fairly good you know, evidence of absence based upon those kind of records. I haven't looked at that data myself, so I can't be confident about it. But I would, I would tend to believe that 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 kind of that kind of archaeological data could really tell us that brook brown trout are more of a recent addition. I, I'd, I'd be curious to see the papers and evidence, but it, it certainly sounds plausible to me. And actually, related to this, um, I mentioned ancient DNA. I haven't, you know, ancient DNA is just kind of you know starting in different places, and people are trying to figure out what it can do. I have a colleague here at Wisconsin. Jake Vandersatten, where he's really interested in, in you know, lake game fish like walleye. And it's actually really unclear where walleye were before 100 years ago, because walleye have been stalked everywhere, right? People intentionally or just on their own put walleye in all the Wisconsin lakes that they could. And now in different parts of the state, you know, walleye populations are maybe declining in some places and doing well in other places. And we don't really know what its historic range was before these various introductions. And so this might possibly be a place where ancient DNA could help us out. If we actually find evidence from these lake sediments of different species and start to constrain what their, what their ranges were. Now, it's a lot of new tech and we'll see what it actually could deliver on, but it's the kind of thing that, you know, it might let us diagnose species presences or absences in, in places where the traditional fossil record like pollen and so forth couldn't do that. So, you know, fingers crossed, we have some new discoveries coming with this, new methods coming our way. Very interesting. Now, obviously, lakes are going to be a, uh, the most desirable place to, uh, to source the sediments to get the data that you're looking for. Is there any hope for uh, sampling sediments uh, in, in the driftless area, uh, such as uh, stream 
terraces or river terraces? And what are yes. the limitations? Yeah, you should sometime have my colleague Eric Carson come over and give a talk. He's a, he's a river geomorphologist. He's at the Wisconsin Geological and Natural History Survey. And he's done a lot of work on the, on the Driftless area and all of his rivers. And he's pretty convinced that there are some places where there, where there are former lakes that used to be like, you know, dammed up by ice or by outwash from the ice. And now they're farm fields or marshlands or what have you, but there are lake sediments there. So there may be some possibilities with those kind of sites. And then there are places where there are, there are marshes and marshes are pretty good places to get these kind of records from too. So I, I definitely think we could get more records like that, um, that, that Tamarack Creek record that would go back five or 6,000 years. And depending on the question, say human land use and fire regime, those could be really interesting records. Those kind of Devil's Lake records that go back a full 20,000 years, we probably won't see too many of those, but we might keep working the margins and finding other lakes around the periphery that might be useful too. So there are more lakes and paleoecologists out there. So we have that's that's great. We we know Eric Carson. Our viewers may remember his talk. I think it was three years ago now, and he was speaking about the ancient Wyalusing River, the predecessor of today's Wisconsin River, and how it uh, that river would have flowed from west to east until about a million years ago. This is the same uh, Eric Carson, right? That's the same one. That's a great story. I'm glad he's given that talk. It's such an interesting part of the history of this area. Right, but that was a long time ago, and so uh, that in 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 the data that you've got, we don't see those changes from a million years ago. But are there uh, other related things uh, that we have pollen uh, data for in a more recent time that's related to those changes? Well, some of the other work is like you know, he's done this great work on this sort of you know major stream reversal about a, a million years ago. That that part you've heard about. He's also done work on the same time period of the last 20,000 years. And one of his findings is that, you know, of course, the Wisconsin River is one of the big outlets that's carrying all this meltwater away from the ice sheet. So, you know, 20,000 years ago, the Wisconsin River is even bigger than it is today with all this meltwater coming down it. And it, it probably produced a lot of sandy outwash along the margins that may have dammed up some of the side valleys that feed into the Wisconsin River. And so that's where, you know, there's this idea that maybe some of these kind of outwash dammed side valleys that might have been lakes 20,000 years ago. And that's, that's based upon some of the work he's been doing. He, he, he drives all over the drift area with a drill rig, you know, drilling different places, trying to get a sense of what sits underneath, you know, farm fields or, um, uh, you know, marshland and so forth. And he has found evidence that places that are, you know, say farm field today might have been a lake you know, during the last ice age because of this kind of damming process that I've described. That sounds like another great talk for the future. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Tom and Kay have got a question. As the permafrost in the Arctic thaws, how much will the trapped methane gas uh, be released? And, and if that is released, does that in turn accelerate uh, warming? It's a big concern. Yeah, they're, 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 it's a great question. And it, it, is, it is the kind of thing where, um, you know, there's, there is a lot of buried carbon. We think about, you know, where is that carbon buried? The Arctic um, permafrost, which is all the soil and peat and ice all frozen together. Some places that 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 ice and permafrost is meters deep, and some places that it's, it's hundreds of meters deep. So there's a lot of frozen carbon up in the Arctic. And right when that when that ice melts, the bacteria it's like you know taking you know taking the, the, the pork roast out of the out of the freezer. The bacteria start to get at it, and they start to respire and break down all that carbon. And then that's in that in that soil. And then they start to release carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. So that becomes what we call a positive feedback loop. You warm the Arctic, that permafrost melts, microbes get at that buried carbon, they respire it, that, car that carbon dioxide methane goes to the atmosphere, that leads to more warming and that accelerates the process. And so yes, it is a big concern. Um, everybody agrees that it is potentially a very big feedback and the, the question becomes how quickly will that methane, how quickly will that ice melt and how quickly will that methane get released? And so that is something that people are paying a lot of attention to right now. Well, um, if part of the reason why we thought it would be exciting to have you uh, present a little bit about uh, the climate of, of history since the last ice age was to kind of get a better pic picture of how inhabitants of the Driftless area may have lived. And you know, what kind of resources would have been av available? What was the context of life like? And so how much um, of that is uh, 
uh, do we have direct evidence for and how much has to be inferred based upon what we can gather about different kinds of plant and animal communities and what coexists together based on uh, paleoclimate? Yeah, well, you can see that we have very good records of past ecosystems from these pollen records. And of course, I've sort of, sort of explained they're often adjacent to the driftless area, but still they're often represented. And so we do have a pretty good sense of what the, what the vegetation was like during this period of human habitation and, and expansion and cultural innovation. Um, and I, I do think we can, th we can start to think about, you know, of course, there's a famous Clovis, you know, big game uh, hunters of, you know, say 13,000 years ago, you know, clearly with the toolkits adapted for those big animals that I showed in some of those pictures, and then moving to more of the more recent periods and, uh, you, know, you know, societies using fire as a management strategy and, and so forth. So, and I would say too, uh, in my own work, most of my work kind of focuses on sort of climate vegetation interactions you've kind of seen here. I would personally love to learn more about the human dimension of all this and learn more about the archaeological record, what it tells us about these early societies and how they're interacting with these changing environments. But we do good, we do have good records of past vegetation and we do have good records of past climate. Actually, another another talk to have you come by, have someone come by and give, give is that their um, caves are increasing a place where we get these very long um, isotope records from the, the stalactites and stalagmites. Those isotope records have climate signals in them. And there's a new uh, cave record from the from uh, Cave of the Mounds. And they've got a new, oh. yeah, it's a hundred thousand year record. So that would be a one to come by and it's one of our longest, best records now of climate history in this area. Fabulous. Well, that is another great idea for the future. And um, anyone who is interested in this talk I, uh, and uh, the idea of uh, human habitation of the driftless here over the last 13,000 years, would love to invite you to tune in next week um, when a panel of archeologists will, will present 13,000 years of driftless ingenuity. And uh, so we'd, we'd love for you to tune in Next week uh, as well, uh, Dr. Williams, if you're interested, I'll send you a link and uh, we couldn't be more uh, thankful for you sharing some of your time and wisdom uh, with our museum audiences. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your attention and time. I've really, it's been a great conversation today. Well, it's been great to meet you uh, and thank you so much to all for tuning in. Good night. <laughs>